music Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadow. with me, church. Heavenly Father, we are here. We are gathered to worship your holy name, to hear from your word, to be more like you. Just pray that we would bless us with more of you this morning, that you would give us sight of your victory, Lord. Instead of all that's happening around us, Lord, give us spiritual eyes to see what you have done and what you're continuing to do and what you are and have promised to do in the future, Lord. Help us be filled with faith this morning, filled with power, filled with joy, filled with hope, so that we can truly show the world that we are empowered by the God of all things. And Lord, help us to proclaim a gospel that brings the world to its knees in hope and desire, Lord, in humility and in repentance before a holy God. Just mobilize your church to carry your truth all around this world this morning. We love you, we thank you, and we have not lost any fight, Lord. We are your people, and we have won, assuredly. And you are great and you are mighty and you are ruling today and you have promised great things for all of eternity. We just thank you. We're filled with joy and thanksgiving this morning. Just be with us in our interaction with you and your word and with each other. We ask these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's take some time and greet each other this morning. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, 
One day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory
Jesus held. Who has held the oceans in his hand?
nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, receive our praises this morning. We pray that they would be a sweet sound to your ear. And now as we get into your word, Lord, I pray that you would do a supernatural work in our hearts, Lord. Give us spiritual eyes to see what you have said, what you have spoken. Give us the power to apply it, Lord. We're here for you. We want to be more like you. And we recognize and acknowledge that's something that we cannot do on our own. So, Lord, we just pray that you'd show up in a big way this morning as we open up your eternal word that will last forever. Help us to be shaped by it, Lord. Shape us by your power and your presence, God, right now in this moment. As we read from what you have said and sent to your church, Lord, glorious truths, we want to know them and we want to conform to them, Lord. So be with us this morning. We love you. And just bless the rest of our service. We ask that in your name. And everybody said, amen. You may have a seat. We're in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. House lights. the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Well, you guys should have known that one. <laughs> and yes, you can now be seated. Let me pray once again. Lord, with open Bibles, we... We are seeking to hear from you, to be filled with your power and presence and joy that is our strength, and that we might be more obedient as disciples growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ right now through the preaching of your word. Do that work by the Spirit here we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, a quick aside, I I just realized as I was getting ready to come up that I hadn't mentioned to the congregation what's coming after Matthew. As you can see, we're finishing the gospel uh, this morning with the Great Commission, and we shared last week at our church family meeting, which was just awesome. Thank you all for coming back out for that, but but plenty of you probably haven't heard that after this, we we jump into October, and um, as you might know, October 31st is Reformation Day, not Halloween, okay? Reformation Day. And so we're going to take the five Sundays in October and do each of the solas of the Reformation. And these are the foundations of our faith as Protestant evangelical Christians. And so we're going to look at each of those uh, through October. And then we're going to jump into a, a series called Standing Firm and Equipped. And we're not going to be going through a, a, another book quite yet. We're going to take Sundays to hit topics each week that have to deal with living as faithful, equipped Christians in our day today. There's a lot going on. How does the word apply to living in the midst of a Marxist revolution, right? In the midst of an LGBT sexual revolution. How does the word apply in the midst of an abortion holocaust? How does the word apply in the midst of all kinds of things going on in politics? And should Christians even be involved? And we're going we're gonna to tackle all of that and more. Um, so we're, we're looking to stand firm and equipped as Christians, and so that's where we're going. Praise the Lord. And really, this morning's message is the end of the Gospel of Matthew, but it's also the foundation for everything we'll be talking about every week from here on out, the Great Commission. John MacArthur um, shares a story at the end of his Matthew commentary regarding the Great Commission verses that we just read, and he says this, Some years ago, a missionary went to a primitive pagan society, and she became especially burdened for a young wife, and by God's grace was eventually used to win that woman to Christ. Almost as soon as she was saved, the woman told the missionary with great sorrow, I wish you could have come sooner 
so my, my little boy could have been saved. When the missionary asked why it was too late, the mother replied, because just weeks before you came to us, I offered him as a sacrifice to the gods of our tribe. These are literally the last words in John MacArthur's four-volume commentary set on the Gospel of Matthew, this story. And it is effective in awakening the reader to the whole point of the Gospel of Matthew, to the whole point of the Gospel, to the whole point of this climactic conclusion in the Great Commission. The point being, Almighty God has made provision for sinners a redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is one Savior for this lost sinful world. And only by the preaching of that gospel to every tongue, tribe, and nation will sinners be saved from their idolatry and rescued from eternal hell. Only by the preaching of that gospel. There's this, this urgency to, to go and bring the gospel to them, right? If you'd only come a few weeks earlier. Do we this morning, do we feel the great need of the world with more than 7 billion image bearers of God walking on a broad road that leads to destruction, blinded by Satan to keep them from seeing the light of the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ? Do we, do we feel this morning the, the reality of 3.3 billion of those image bearers never even having heard the name of Jesus. Never heard. No access to the gospel. No churches. No missionaries. They don't have Bibles. Do we feel the need this morning of the world and also of our own nation? As we were just praying today, right? Don't, don't think for a second that this paganism and this idolatry and child sacrifice is reserved for the primitive societies that don't have gospel access, right? Right? Most likely, your neighbor, your co-worker, maybe your family member, is lost and headed to hell and is celebrating their idols, their sexual perversions, the sacrifice of 65 million children in our Christian nation. It's right here. Do we feel the need of the world for the truth of Jesus Christ? The world is so lost, and what is their only hope? Their only hope is the gospel of Jesus. The only hope for any sinner, for any nation, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only hope of ever hearing and believing that message of salvation is the church going and making disciples of all nations. Amen. The only hope. These words at the end of Matthew are, they are purposefully abrupt. Right? Just, it just ends. It's the climax of the whole book. Some scholars I read would even argue it's the climax of the whole Bible. And the gospel ends abruptly after Christ says these words. We, we know in Acts chapter 1 that it's right after this that he ascends back to heaven. But in, gospels, in Matthew's gospel, he just, he just ends with that promise at the end of the Great Commission. Just ends abruptly. Why? Because these words are meant to reverberate down the corridors of time in the church age to ring in our ears, this is the mission. This is what our lives are for. This is what the church is for. These words right here. We have so many good things that we can and should be involved in, whether serving people, helping the needy, or establishing justice. But there is one thing that sets apart the church with an absolutely unique mission that, that no one else will or can fulfill. And that is the preaching of the gospel for the salvation of sinners. That is our mission alone, church. There, no, no other organization, no government, no institution has been commissioned with this duty. Only the church Talk about essential. Es absolutely essential. The church is essential as the only beacon of hope for the world seeing Christ's light and being reconciled to God. And sadly, so many churches are absolutely failing to be Great Commission churches in practice. In word, yes. Most would not 
ever say they're not Great Commission churches. But in practice, in obedience, no. If there was ever a question to this, that if that's really true of the church at large, because we make a lot of statements about the church in America or the church in the West, right? If there was ever a question to this, the COVID lockdowns and restrictions completely prove the point that most churches don't see themselves as essential. And the truth is, a lot of them are not because they don't preach the gospel. And so they know they're not essential, and they closed their doors. And you say, yeah, 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 but that was to keep people safe, and it's not like, the, like we still couldn't preach the gospel. But were you? Were people? Or were church stores closed and a lot of Christians binge-watching Netflix? Right? At, at a time when the world was most eager for what's next, most terrified about death, most hopeless, right? Churches failed the COVID test, had their doors closed, and weren't preaching the gospel. And the sad reality is... Many churches have not been obeying the Great Commission for a long time. We may be saying go, but really, we, we, what we really mean is sit around and wait pe for people to ask us, you know, about the gospel so that we can share with them, or wait around until people wander into the church building and maybe hopefully the pastor will share the gospel with them. Or what we, what we really mean when we say go is just try to be the nicest Christian and make the most friends and ha be, be the most liked by non-Christians as possible and and maybe they'll eventually want what you have. But don't in any way ever share something from God's Word that might offend them and risk your, uh, your re relationship with them, your reputation. That would be a bad witness. And that's what we mean by go. Friends, as you know, I am passionate about this because I... Does the church even understand today what its mission is? <laughs> it's been so diluted... I mean, what, what is it Christ is actually commanding us to do? Not just do, but give our lives for. To lay our lives down for. Have we, have we, has your life been absolutely shaped by these words as it's meant to do? Your whole life shaped. Every decision, your agenda, your purpose, is it shaped by these words? Or have we so totally gutted these words from any real meaning and power and urgency and we've just spiritualized the application and excused ourselves with that was for the apostles or this commission was it's for pastors and missionaries we need to recover again this morning what these words mean and why they are the final words of our lord before he ascended back to the right hand of the father here's the big idea for your notes it's that we obey the Great Commission, trusting in the authority and promise of the risen Christ. That we be a people that obey the Great Commission, trusting in the authority and the promise of the risen Christ. Number one for your notes, trust the authority of the risen Christ. Look at verse 16 and 17 again. <clears throat> It says, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So, for context, we remember this is the resurrected Christ. He died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day, just as he said. And now, it says in Acts chapter 1, for these 40 days, he's been revealing himself to the disciples and he's been teaching them about the kingdom. And he gave them at some point directions about meeting him on a specific mountain in Galilee. And now they've come and they've gathered. And, and they would soon come to realize these are his final words before he ascends back to heaven. And this group that's on the mountain, as you put the gospel accounts together, is, is, is not just the 11 disciples. It's a, it's a larger group of disciples. Likely could even be the 500 that are referenced in 1 Corinthians 15 that he appeared to all at one time. And so they're gathered on the mountain. They worship him. And then look at verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Understand first this morning, church, the authority that is Christ's as the resurrected, ascended God-man seated at the right hand of the Father. How much authority does he possess, church? All. All authority. But that, that's surely limited to heaven, right? No. All authority in heaven and on earth. Well, when you say earth, surely you just mean over the church, right? No. All authority in all the earth. Okay? Over believer and unbeliever. Over the church, over Satan, over geopolitical states and governors and kings. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He has all authority over all the heavens and all the earth and everything there is. Just think about how marvelous that claim is. Think about how magnificent our Lord is and the power and the authority and the right and the sovereignty He has as the King of kings. Let's, let's consider that this morning as kind of a lengthy po- uh, quote from Pastor John Piper elaborates for our minds, our hearts this morning, what's encompassed in those words, all authority. He has authority over Satan and all demons, over all angels, good and evil. Authority over the natural universe, natural objects and laws and forces like stars, galaxies, planets, meteorites. Authority over all weather systems, winds, rains, lightning, thunder, hurricanes, tornadoes, monsoons, typhoons, cyclones. Authority over all of their effects, tidal waves, floods, fires. Authority over all molecular and atomic reality. Atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, undiscovered subatomic particles, quantum physics, genetic structures, DNA, chromosomes. Authority over all plants and animals, great and small, whales and redwoods, giant squid and giant oaks, all fish, all wild beasts, all invisible animals and plants like bacteria, viruses, parasites, germs. Authority over all the parts and functions of the human body. Every beat of the heart, every breath of the diaphragm, every electrical jump across a million synapses in our brain. Authority over all nations and governments, congresses and legislatures, presidents and kings and premiers and courts. Authority over all armies and weapons and bombs and terrorists. Authority over all industry and business and finance and currency. Authority over all entertainment and amusement and leisure and media. Over all education and research and science and discovery. Authority over all crime and violence. Over all families and all neighborhoods. And over his body, the church. And over every soul and every moment of every life that has been or ever will be lived. There is nothing in heaven or on earth over which Jesus does not have authority, that is, does not have the right and power to do with as he pleases. This is the authority of our Savior. All authority. This here, this pronouncement, this reality, this truth is, that, is the foundation for the commission he's about to give his disciples. Because he's commanding this ragtag group of men and women to go to every people group on the earth, peoples with their own traditions and values and languages and religions and beliefs, and to go to all of them and to tell them to repent and become followers of the one true God and His crucified, risen Son, Jesus Christ. Think about that. That's what He's calling us to go do, to go tell people to stop everything you've been believing and doing and to turn instead to trust and obey Jesus, this Jewish Messiah. That's simply outrageous, right? That, that, that's outrageous then as much as it's outrageous in our day to think about this 
commission, this, this audacity for us weak little nobodies to go into our own culture that is relativistic and multicultural, right? And you got the um, all religions are equal kind of culture, and we're to go to them and tell them Jesus is the only way. You need to repent. There's only one Savior, one forgiveness of sins, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. You must repent, submit to Him in faith, or you will perish in hell. The audacity of doing that, right? Like, who's going to listen to us? Why would they listen to us? Where would, where would we get off thinking that we can go in? Here's your warrant. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. That's your, that's your search warrant. Okay? Yeah, you can bust in. Here's the warrant. How dare you come in and try to tell me? Here's the warrant, right? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is his. Yeah, we have authority to come in and tell you because here's what Jesus said. Here's who Jesus is. We have that authority because of his authority. Now, doing such a thing will get you ridiculed and mocked in our culture. It'll get you killed in other places. It would be outrageous if we did this on our own authority. So before Jesus tells us to go do this radical, politically incorrect Audacious thing, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I am sending you, I am sending you to tell them to repent because I have authority over them. They are mine. I am sovereign. They are accountable to me. And I can change hearts and minds as I please by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Church. Act like that is true. Live like that is true because it is. We just need to believe it. We need to live in accordance with it. We may suffer and die for the gospel in this life, but Christ will be victorious. This mission will not fail because all authority in heaven and earth is his. And we're going to be winners eternally in the end too because we are going to reign with him. So trust the authority of Christ. Trust the authority of your Lord this morning. And then because of that, number two for your notes, obey the commission of the risen Christ. Trust his authority and then go obeying the commission of the risen Christ. He says there, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is, this is what we call the Great Commission. And as has been rightly pointed out by many others, it is not the Great Suggestion, as so many churchgoers try to treat it today, right? It is the commission in which we are commanded by our Lord to go and, and live our lives fully on mission for His glory, for His kingdom now. That's why we exist now. And so let's see what's entailed in this commission, this command from our Lord. First, go. Go for your notes. The command begins with go. Not stay, not wait, but go. Go to the ones who need to become disciples. Go find them and tell them the truth. Go. This is about intentionality. It's about purpose. It's about the agenda, the, the direction of your life. You're now, you're now prioritizing things to give intentionality to, at some point, you got to get up off your couch and go. At some point, you got to get up off your pew from the church and go, right? Some of us and some families have to leave their own family and people group and go to another nation. There, there's got to be an intentional going to bring the gospel to the lost that need Christ. And yet, such a simple, obvious aspect, observation of the commission, go, go, and yet we've what? We've totally flipped that on its head today. And instead of going to the lost, the primary means of making disciples is we're going to build big auditoriums and add these attractive elements and all this entertainment and anything else that we might think would draw unbelievers to what? Come to us. 
And at the end of the day, the church turns into an absolute circus. It, it, the church is competing with the world to try to, you know, get people's attention, people's affection. We've turned the whole thing on its head because what, the problem with that whole methodology, seeker-sensitive movement, purpose-driven, is that whatever you attract them with to Christ is what you'll have to keep attracting them with, right? And the problem is that they're never attracted to Christ. They're attracted to all the other stuff that you implemented in your so-called church. And so we've totally turned the go on its head, and instead we stay and we make ourselves really comfortable, and we wait for them to come to us. And the pastors of churches are the primary culprits of this nonsense. Okay? As my friend Pastor Chuck O'Neill in Portland calls them the don't go therefore pastors. You got the go therefore pastors and the don't go therefore pastors. And they are the ones that have exchanged Christ's great commission command for the self loving goals of staying popular and prosperous and safe. And as pastors do that, it what? It only leads to the whole congregation then being influenced to, to make the same sophisticated excuses for why they also don't go. And oh, we got great sophisticated reasons why we don't go, right? We fulfill the Great Commission by throwing block parties in our neighborhood and serving good beer so they don't think we're legalists. We fulfill the Great Commission by baking cookies and handing out cold water to people. We fulfill the Great Commission by being inclusive to LGBT folks so they don't think we're all bigots. We fulfill the Great Commission by inviting people to the church carnival. We fulfill the Great Commission by being an, an example or by saying God bless you or by you know, driving the speed limit and tipping well. We have all these excuses and at the, at the end result is that we think we are so smart we are smarter than God. Come up with all these ways for us to be able to fulfill the Great Commission while having our best life now and avoiding needlessly suffering for Christ and facing anything that was experienced by our Lord and His apostles in persecution, hatred, and martyrdom. We, we can avoid all that and still fulfill the Great Commission in our day. What does God think of that? Yahweh is not impressed. God looks upon the wisdom of man. He says, fools, I told you to go. Why did you stay and make yourself comfortable when so many were perishing? When 3,000 unborn image bearers were being slaughtered every day in your nation? When sexual perversion and sin was being celebrated in your society. You made yourself comfortable and you stayed. Why didn't you go when there was a Marxist revolution destroying the family and the fabric of society and ridding this nation of Christianity and children were being abused and forced to wear masks and experimental drugs were being pushed into them and you decided to sit and stay and make yourself comfortable. Why didn't you go? Why didn't you go, pastor? Why didn't you go, church leader? You made yourself comfortable, and yet Christ has commanded us to get up and go because we possess the message of eternal life and freedom and forgiveness and resurrection power. So people's chains can be unleashed. They can be set free from captivity to Satan. We have that message, church. There's power in the gospel. Go. It starts with going. What are we going to do? We're going to, number two, make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. In other words, this is evangelism. We're, we're converting people to Christ and then baptizing them, right? We're, we're evangelizing the lost so that they put their faith in Christ and become followers of Jesus like us. It, it literally says there in the Greek, go therefore discipling the nations. Discipling, which has led some translators to say, Instead, go teaching the nations. Go teaching the nations because the reality is we, we actually can't what? We can't make disciples as if we have the power to convert them in and of ourselves, right? We, we teach, we preach, we explain the gospel. 
the duties are as results belong to God. The Holy Spirit regenerates and saves. And so our job then is to what? Go and preach. When it says make disciples, here, go and preach. Go and teach. Or as it's recorded in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the Great Commission, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Okay? Go proclaim. Go preach. Because how are they to call on him unless they believe? And how are they to believe unless they hear? And how are they to hear unless what? Someone preaches. And so we are to go. Our job is to go and preach, go teach the gospel. And, and to do so, listen, in such a way that with such long-suffering, with such patience, that we, that we see disciples made. Even though it's not on us, the results, right? But, but our job is more than just cast the seed far and wide. We, we are to long for conversion, long for real life change and repentance. We're, we're to see disciples made, which means, as like Spurgeon says, we're never to be content with empty nets. We're, our aim is to make disciples. We're, we're to not just be like, well, you know, I put it on Facebook and everyone technically has had a chance to become my friend, and if they didn't, that's on them, and it's out there now, right? And, and I've scattered the seed far and wide, I'm done. No, we're to, we're to invest and to pour into, and if we're not seeing fruit, if we're not seeing conversions, we are, to, we are to be on our knees praying to the Lord of the harvest, right? We're to be tilling that land and watering that seed to see disciples made. And who are we to make disciples of? It's not limited at all, is it? All nations, he says. All nations. We need to understand that Jesus here is not talking about geopolitical nations and boundaries as we would know them today. He's He's speaking of distinct ethnic linguistic people groups, okay? And he says, go preach to all of them. Go bring the gospel to all of them because why? Because you need to understand, church, God has chosen and ransomed a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation to one day worship around the throne in heaven, Revelation 5.9. He has a people. He has a chosen people that need to, the, the gospel, and, and he's chosen people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. He's ransomed them from every tongue, tribe, and nation. So we're to preach to them because there's only one Savior of the world, and there's only one gospel. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Understand today, church, Jesus is not a little tribal deity, the God of the Jews only, right? He is Lord of all. Go. Bring that message of this Lord to all of the nations. That's important for us, church, to keep in our, in our, in our forefront as a church. We at Wellspring have um, had the great history of supporting missions and sending, commissioning our own people as missionaries. And yet at the same time, it's really been a while since we've, as a church, been involved in personally commissioning one of our own or a family of our own to go to the ends of the earth. And I think if we're a healthy church, if we're a, a maturing church, we should expect to see the Spirit of God move that way in our midst. Amen? So is that, is that you this morning? Is that you? We need to understand that Jesus calls His church, every local church, to be involved in not just sharing Christ with our neighbors, but in supporting and or going to those unreached people groups that have never even heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to go make disciples of all nations, and then what? Thirdly, for your notes, baptize. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the commission here is really, we understand it's not just make converts, right, that are just going to give lip service. It's make disciples, those who are going to be obedient to Christ. As Lord. And that first step of obedience to Christ is what? Anyone? Baptism. See, you're hesitant because we got a problem. I'll address it in a minute. The first step of obedience to Christ is baptism. Being immersed in water, as we do here at the river, wherever, it, that is a public declaration of your faith in Christ. It's an outward symbol of 
a physical symbol that we can see, touch, feel, right? It's an outward symbol of an internal spiritual reality that has already happened. Namely, what's that reality? That you have been united to Christ through faith. As you become united through faith to Christ, you unite in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection, and that is then symbolized as you obediently get immersed. It's symbolized by going under the waters and coming out with resurrection life and power. And baptism is so closely associated with salvation in the Scriptures that some cults have made the fatal mistake of requiring baptism for salvation. But we know that's wrong because that would be to add a work to the gospel of grace that can only be received through faith, right? It's a gift of grace that can only be received through faith. You can't add any works to that. But also it would seem that many have made the opposite error today and and we've so distanced baptism from salvation that a lot of Christians kind of treat it as optional. Or that's something that I might do one day when I'm when I'm more mature, that's something for Christians who want to get really serious about following Jesus and really be a disciple. False. Okay? There's no such thing as a Christian who's not a disciple. Every Christian is a disciple. Every disciple is a Christian. If you're not a disciple obeying Christ and following Christ, then you're not a Christian. Okay? The first step of that obedience is to his command to be baptized in his name and make known to everyone of that newfound faith you have, your salvation. Why? Because Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes with his angels. This is important. There's no such thing as secret disciples, disciples that are too ashamed and too embarrassed, too inconvenienced or too lazy or too busy or too fearful to go get baptized they are in disobedience to the Lord. If they persist in that, then their own profession of faith needs to be called into question. If you call Him Lord, but you don't do what He says, all throughout the book of Acts, baptism is shown in the closest possible association with salvation. And so, hear me this morning. If you are trusting in Christ today as your Savior and Lord, there is no legitimate reason to postpone baptism. You obey Him. So we're to go, we're to preach, make disciples, baptize those who respond in faith and repentance. And fourthly, we are to teach. Verse 20, we're to teach. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The commission covers from the beginning of the Christian life to the end of it. Your whole walk with Christ. And as I said earlier, Christians are disciples and disciples are those that are not just professing faith in Christ, but they're obeying the commands of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, there's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't love Christ, and there's no such thing as one who loves Christ but doesn't obey Christ. When you become a Christian, you become a disciple. That doesn't mean, though, suddenly you reach perfection. That's not what we're talking about this morning. We all still sin. We all had a time of prayer, of repentance today, asking for forgiveness. We don't reach perfection, but you do certainly take on a new direction of your life. And that direction is what? Toward conformity to Jesus Christ, right? That's what we call sanctification in the Christian life. And how does that sanctification come about in our Christian life through the teaching of the Word of God primarily. We are to go and teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Fill the world with teaching of the Word of God. Fill the earth with the Word of God. Teach, 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 teach people the Word of God and specifically the commands of Jesus Christ. And as you teach, it's not just information, urge people to observe the commands. Heed them, right? Obey the commands, which means the Christian life is about learning and obeying. We are lifelong learners, lifelong students of Christ, but we're not just learners. We want to apply the Word, right? We want to live the Word. We want to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. Teach them the commands and teach them to obey what He has said. That means that our commission 
is about teaching commands. Listen, this is hard for some people to swallow today because whether you realize it or not, we've been indoctrinated in a form of antinomianism. That, that means no law. It's a theological viewpoint, a heresy. The anti-nomos no, law. No law, right? We are under grace, not under law. And we, so we have this like false understanding of what grace is. And so Christians end up excusing everything. We excuse our sin. We excuse our laziness, our apathy, our disobedience, our passivity. And we say, but, hey, man, we're not under law. We're under grace. We totally misapply that verse. I've heard people upset with the pulpit ministry of this church saying, you're so proud, always preaching so authoritatively and telling us what to do. Well, yeah. That's exactly right. (laughs) Not the pride part, but because that's what Christ calls us to do right here in the commission. We preach authoritatively because we preach God's words, not man's. And therefore, it carries with it the very authority of God. You need to receive it as such, as the word of God, not the word of man. And we tell you what to do because Christ has told us what to do very clearly. Not just told us, he commanded us what to do. And we are to teach people to obey all that Christ has commanded us. We are to teach obedience to the Great Commission. Now remember this. We covered this back in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' words in Matthew 5.19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We will not relax one of the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same. Okay? You've been saved by grace, but you've been called into a life of holiness and obedience to Jesus Christ now. In your sanctification, you are to be growing daily. Like so many pastors out there that are relaxing the commands... We're not going to do that here. If we at Wellspring are not going to strive to be the most obedient disciples that we can possibly be at this church, then I don't know what we're doing here. And we might as well close our doors and end the charade. But I know this is not a charade. I know many of you genuinely desire to keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, growing in obedience, faithfulness, and worship of Him. And that's why we are here this morning. That's why our doors are open to fulfill this commission, teaching all to obey our Lord. Now, understand this, church. You have a role in this, okay? Because, yes, God has gifted certain men to to be teachers in the church. And James 3.1, not many of you should be teachers lest you receive the stricter judgment. There's men who are especially gifted at, at expounding and applying the words so that the saints can, can walk in greater faithfulness and obedience. But also, we're all called to this teaching ministry that he's talking about here, okay? How so? Well, first of all, we're all called to evangelism and every evangelistic conversation involves teaching others who God is, what sin is, what Christ accomplished, the need for repentance and faith, right? We're, we're called to teach in that regard, but also in the church. It's not just, you know, pastors and Sunday school leaders that are to do teaching. Listen to this. The older women are called to teach the younger women, Titus 2, 3. The parents are called to teach their children, Ephesians 6, 4. Husbands called to teach their wives and wash them in the water of the word, Ephesians 5, 26. And all of us, in all of our relationships within the body of Christ, we are all called to exhort one another every day with the word of God, Hebrews 3, 12. We're all involved in this teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So walk, walk in obedience, church, to this. Obey the commission of the risen Christ. And thirdly, lastly here, Rest in the promise of the risen Christ. Look at verse 20 again. Jesus finishes with, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love that promise. Not only do we have Christ's infinite universal authority as our foundation, right? All authority heaven and earth, but then we have this precious promise. 
of Christ's imminent personal presence. And remember, friends, the presence of the living God is the greatest reward in the universe. That is the reward. To be near God. That's, his presence is what makes heaven, heaven. Okay? And, and Jesus is promising us this presence that he will be manifestly with us as we take seriously this mission to go preach Christ. Christ will be with us. Now, Christ is, if you're a Christian, the Spirit dwells in you. Christ is with you. But understand that he will manifest his presence. He, he will make himself known to you and others around you to greater or lesser degrees based on our obedience. You can, you can quench the Holy Spirit, right? Right? And, and we are to draw near to God and then he will draw near to us. So he's with us, but there are also greater and lesser degrees of this blessing of his presence. And I encounter so many Christians that are just longing for wanting to feel that nearness of Christ again. And I'm, I'm with you. I'm not mocking the feeling of the nearness of Christ. I need that every day and I want that. But, but a lot of people are not doing anything that would warrant that greater blessing of his manifest presence. You're walking in disobedience. You're wasting your life and your time. You're quenching the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you want to experience more of Christ's resurrection power and presence, step out in faith and start making disciples. And He will be with you always to the end of the age. It's going to cost you, but the nearness of Christ will be worth it all. I love this from a missionary, John G. Patton, who experienced this firsthand. He wrote, after hiding in a tree all night as hundreds of angry natives hunted him for his life, and he said this in his journal, I climbed into the tree and was left there alone in the bush. The hours I spent there live all before me as if it were but of yesterday. I heard the frequent discharging of muskets and the yells of the savages. Yet I sat there among the branches as safe as in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw near to me and speak more soothingly in my soul than when the moonlight flickered among those chestnut leaves and the night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all my heart to Jesus. Alone, yet not alone. If it be to glorify my God, I will not grudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree to feel again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy His consoling fellowship. That, my friends, is the promise of Jesus, that He Himself will be with us. And that is such great comfort because just think about who it is that's saying these words. It's the one with all authority in heaven and earth over every enemy, every virus, every calamity, every disease, right? He promises to be with you, to keep you, to empower you, to sustain you, to provide for you so that not a hair of your head shall perish. That's the amazing promise. And how long does that promise, is it good for? To the end of the age, right? Right? The end of the age being the return of Jesus Christ. That promise is enduring. It is unbreakable. As long as the world lasts, Jesus will be with us. But note this. His promise lasts to the end of the age because our mission lasts to the end of the age. It's not over. It continues. There's more work to do. And so, in conclusion, let me ask you to reflect this morning with me. Will you be great commissioned disciples? Will you be go therefore disciples or don't go therefore disciples? Like so many who are just content to stay in the four walls and just attend occasionally and check the box. Where is God moving you this morning to be bold and to share Christ, to be intentional with this glorious gospel that we have? Is God moving some of you here, calling you to unreached people amongst a different culture, a different language? Is He calling you to that 1040 window where missionaries go to lose their lives? That's part of the commission. Jesus promised that this commission will be successful ultimately 
But it's going to cost us blood, sweat, and tears, and some of us, our lives, right? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's where God spreads the gospel most powerfully. But Jesus promises what? Above all, no matter what happens, I will be with you. I will be with you, saints. So take courage. Take courage this morning and go with authority. Go trust in His presence. Go trust in the promise. You are a sent people. That This is why we quote this text every Sunday at the end of service so that as, as you're leaving this building, you have those words ringing in your heart and minds as you walk out those doors so that you are laser focused on your mission. You wear it as an identity. You are sent. Go. Be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we humbly worship you, the one with all authority and power and supremacy and sovereignty, the king above all kings. You are great and incomparable, matchless in glory. We love you, God, and we bow the knee to you and want to grow in obedience to you. So thankful for the salvation you provided by grace. There's nothing we could have done. No way to pay back our sin, the debt we owed. No righteousness in us, but you, Jesus, are our Savior. Died and rose again. Lord, we want to take seriously these words this morning that you've called us to a, a life on mission for you, a life of sharing the gospel, a life of making disciples, of teaching others what your word says. And so equip us and help us and strengthen us today to be obedient, to apply this word, to walk in faithfulness by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we would glorify you in the, the short life that we get here on this earth to advance your kingdom. Thank you for what a glorious privilege it is to be your ambassadors. Nothing else could compare as a purpose for our lives. We give you glory, Jesus. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Let's stand and respond with song.
Strength is in your name. My strength is in your name. For you alone can say, you will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall
Amen. Let's say this together as a church family. And Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Have an awesome week, folks.